The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Ilsoy Advisor webinar on soil sampling, brought to you by the Illinois Soybean Checkoff. My name is Mark Ingridson. I will be moderating the webinar today. A couple of housekeeping items. If you included your CCA number when you're registered uh, and you stay with us for the entire presentation, your number will be automatically submitted for a CEU in nutrient management. If you're listening to a recording of this webinar, you will need to go to the Certified Crop Advisor website, log into your account, and apply for a self-study credit. We have opportunities to ask questions throughout the webinar using the chat feature. We'll have about 10 or 15 minutes at the end of the presentation to do those. Um, we do ask that you keep your questions brief and to one point only if possible. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce Terry Wiscala. Terry is an independent crop consultant based out of Nashville, Illinois. Today, he will cover how to collect a soil sample what spatial patterns to follow, what range of tests to, to consider, and how to interpret soil test results. With that, I'll hand it off to Terry. And thanks again, Terry, for leading this webinar today. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, good morning to everyone. Uh, when I got up here in Southern Illinois this morning, it was a beautiful, cool morning for, for this time of year in August, which uh, we, we are still in dire need of rain down this way which will, will lead us into this soil testing because I'm already receiving calls about soil sampling. And, and right now I, I need rain to be able to get a soil probe in the ground. And, and uh, that, that's gonna make for an interesting year. And I'll allude to some of that here a little later when I talk about actual soil samples and a little bit on timing. But I'm gonna go ahead and jump ahead to the, the next slide, our objectives. And, and for some of you guys, this may be, and ladies, this may be a little bit basic but but this is more on, on soil testing and, and not as much on nutrient management. So when, when we look at soil testing, we want to estimate the, the nutrient status of the soil. And, and I stress that word estimate because uh, soil testing is not an exact science. And, and those of you familiar with the Illinois Agronomy Handbook, we have a, a soil test rating scale in that booklet. And, and some of the tests have a, a pretty good rating. Some of them do not. Uh, one in particular that we've been concerned with here over the last few years is sulfur and zinc and the, the reliability of those two tests are only in about that 40 to 45 percent range even with our, our new technologies. I mean we, we've got people working on developing new tests but, but right now that's the best we've got. Uh, another objective we want to identify that variability uh, of nutrient status in, in our fields and, and this is going to be very important for our four R's and especially in Illinois and, and here in the Midwest with the nutrient loss reduction strategy. We, we've got to keep these things in check so we, we don't have forced regulation like we do in some areas of the, the world and especially at, like out east in the Chesapeake Bay area because they, they are in a hotbed with, with forced regulation and, and uh, the nutrient management uh, part of it is, is really sticky out there. And, and we just really don't want to see that here in the Midwest or are we going to have Something like that in the future, I feel there will be some guidelines, but we, we don't want forced regulation. And, and lastly, on this slide, it predicts the likelihood of a crop response when we apply additional nutrients. When, when we take our soil tests and get our base values, uh, if we have low testing soils, we'll probably see a, a pretty good crop response on these low testing soils, uh, especially a lot of the soils I, I deal with here in southern Illinois with, with low potassium values we can see a good soybean or double crop soybean response to those. Uh, on the other side of that coin, if we have high testing soils, uh, like I see on a lot of livestock operations, we may not see a response to, to added additional nutrients. So to, to kind of tie in with that first slide, uh, when we estimate the, that nutrient status of the soil, when we soil sample, a good soil sample is that first step. And, and I, I, I won't lie to you, but uh, uh, about this, but soil sampling and soil testing can sometimes lie to you. Uh, a soil sample is only as good as that sample collected and how it's handled uh, and uh, getting it to the laboratory for testing. Uh, if a, a soil tests low and we take a plant sample, 
in, in conjunction with that, we may have adequate nutrients in that plant sample, and, and that, that begs the question if we should go back and, and take another soil sample from that area and have it rechecked. And, and when we base soil sampling uh, intensity on, on expected field variability, that uh, is going to lead us into a couple of slides here a little later on zone versus grid sampling. Um, so I'll jump ahead again. Soil sampling procedures. Make sure you have all the, the equipment you need. Uh, most of you folks are all aware of this, that, that we need the soil probe. We can still do it with a, a shovel, but it's time consuming. And, and for someone like me, I, I, I still do the hand probe. I know there's automated probes that can be pulled with a tractor or automated probes that can be mounted on a four-wheeler, but I, I'm still a little old-fashioned for these Southern Illinois soils. I like to do it all by hand. Uh, you know, so we're going to divide that field up in, into our uniform areas, and, and we'll group that by crop history. We may look at soil type, topography. There's a, a whole host of factors we could look at as, as we collect those soil samples. Procedures. We want to follow lab instructions for handling, and the agronomy handbook uh, here in Illinois has a, a a good guideline for for collecting those samples. Uh, for myself, I, I look at taking that that seven inch sample or six and two thirds because that's how our, our tables for for build up and maintenance in Illinois is, is calibrated through the U of I. Uh, I will still take the shallow samples. I take a two to four inch sample in that no-till environment, but I'm only checking pH only in those particular samples. In, in no-till, we're throwing all of our nutrients and lime on that soil surface, and, and we need to occasionally take that shallower sample and monitor pH because pH can have a, a strong influence on some of our soil applied herbicides. And then we're gonna make, make sure we try to keep those uh, samples clean and, and get them into a soil sample bag and, and avoid cross-contamination from sample to sample. Okay, as I talked about the, the different uh, approaches, whether we look at grid or management zones, uh, those management zones could actually, in the bottom right, could be defined as uh, soil type management zones. We may actually use uh, yield maps to drive that zone management. Uh, of the different types, the, the grid sampling is the most popular, and, and I tend to use what I call a hybridized version. I don't do a center point grid. I, I do have the ability to digitize out a field boundary and get the estimated acres on a field. And then from there, I can determine how many soil samples I want to collect from that field, get the uh, bags labeled, and, and, and have a lot of legwork done before I ever get to the field. But like I said, I use a hybridized version. If I pull into the field and I'm following the little cursor to that soil sample point, and I get there, and it's not representative of that two and a half acre grid that I'm using, I can move that point and, and take that sample elsewhere within that grid. Uh, management zone, uh, I don't prescribe to the management zone for, for my work here in Southern Illinois. We have too many different soil types in the, these fields and, and, and too many different changes uh, within that field that uh, I want more samples. With, with management zone sampling, you can reduce your number of samples greatly because you may be sampling by soil type or yield history. And, and in actuality, when you soil sample by yield history, you are soil sampling by soil type because we have our different management zones per se off of that yield map and those, those tend to line up very well with, with our soil type maps. And as a, an example, we may have the same soil type in, in a field that is on a north facing slope and a south facing slope. Those two particular slopes can have different soil test results just due to their aspect and orientation. So I'll still prescribe to a grid for, for my work, but I have good friends of mine not too far away from me that, that do zone sampling as well. So neither one, is, is, I, I think, carries more weight than the other. The, the important part to get across here is we need to be soil sampling, know our nutrient levels, and, and be prepared when we're looking at this nutrient loss reduction strategy. Okay, so I'm going to kind of switch gears here and, and look at uh, a little bit with lime, P and K. Uh, why should we uh, lime those acid soils once we get the, the soil test results back? And as I'd mentioned previously, that when I look at soil applied herbicides, very low pHs if, if those soils are very acidic or higher pHs if they're, they're basic. And I'm talking about soils that are 7.2 to 
to maybe seven, eight, uh, we can affect the performance of these soil applied herbicides. And a couple of examples in particular, a couple of years ago, I had a an issue where, where double crop soybeans, I had 600 acres, uh, died due to a high soil pH, very wet soil conditions, and, and prior to emergence, a, a gramoxone metribuzin application. And it was a, a crop response with the metribuzin, high pH, and, and wet soils, and it was actually the metribuzin killed these beans. We had 600 acres of double crops that had to be replanted, so it was it was quite, quite catastrophic for the, the farmer. Luckily, we had 100% replant, but it, it, it begged to, to, to question what kind of uh, soil testing had he done in the past. And and, and from there, it, it, it he picked up more work, and, and, and we did a lot more testing, and we had to watch our, our herbicides from that point forward. Uh, the other thing about acid soils, it'll reduce the activity of our infixing bacteria on those beans. Uh, Unfortunately, with all of our microbes in the soil, our good and our bad, they like a pH range of 6.8 to maybe 7.1. Uh, like I said, unfortunately, we need that pH range to be up there higher for those soybeans and, and uh, get that good nodulation so we produce nitrogen to that soybean plant all season. We can apply nitrogen to soybeans or spoon feed it all season long on a pH of 6 and, it, and beans will respond to the nitrogen fertilization very well, but why should we supply nitrogen fertilizer when we have a bacteria in the soil that will do it for us? And then, like I said, that unfortunate aspect, most of our plant pathogens thrive in that same pH range. So, so we have to uh, do a good job of scouting when we have those higher pHs to make sure we're keeping our pathogens at bay as well. Uh, our clay soils are, are can be higher in acidity and, and they're gonna be less highly aggregated uh, for, for most everybody, I'm sure you've encountered a, a heavy clay soil, and, and we have a higher CEC in those soils, and therefore a higher hydrogen concentration, maybe even some of these southern Illinois soils, uh, aluminum concentration is pretty high, and liming will help uh, take care of that, as well as uh, help to aggregate that soil so we have a little bit better water infiltration and, and movement of water in that soil. And the Last couple ones there, the availability of nutrients such as PK and molybdenum can be reduced in acid soils. And I've included that little chart in the bottom uh, right-hand corner so you can see roughly the nutrient availability. And it also lists the bacteria and the fungi in there as well and, and that aluminum at the very bottom like I talked about. <laughs> okay, as far as the tendency for K to leach, uh, that can uh, increase in, in some soils that are very acidic and our applied uh, potassium fertilizer can actually leach deeper into the profile. So that, that is just uh, uh, one consideration to, to look at when we look at potassium availability in our soils. I haven't seen much data on something like that to, to back up that, that point put out there by the IPNI. Okay, a couple more things. Aluminum, iron, and manganese can reach toxic levels in, in those acid soils. That's why we need to lime. We had a, a liming study years ago at SIU in Carbondale, and, and uh, it killed the soybeans in our plots be, uh, from the manganese toxicity. Uh, wet soils, uh, it had a pH of 5, and, and the manganese will be very soluble, the same way with the iron and the aluminum, and, and we, it's a heavy metal. Uh, albeit it is a micronutrient needed by the crop, it can reach toxic levels in these acid soils. And then as far as reduced activity of our organisms responsible for the, the breakdown of organic matter, they too fall in that range of that 6.8 to 7.1. Uh, many of our uh, microbes, whether they be fungi or bacteria that help break down crop residue, can also be plant pathogens. So all of our plant pathogens like that, that higher pH range. And, and, and most definitely, we could see a calcium or magnesium deficiency in these, these highly acidic soils, especially those here in southern Illinois. Okay, switch gears to phosphorus, just a couple of statements on, on the importance of, of soil testing and, and phosphorus supply to plants. Phosphorus, is, is main two components is it's used for energy transfer. Those that remember your plant physiology course from college, uh, we had uh, several lectures about ADP and ATP. Those are the energy transfer molecules within the plant that, that keep that plant healthy and, and move things around in the plant. 
Uh, phosphorus is also an essential part of fighting our nucleic acids and our phospholipids, all, all of which give that plant good health. So when we look at the, the soil test and, and we're starting to look at these results, we also want to look at phosphorus availability and, and what affects phosphorus availability in the soil. We'll look at the amount and type of clay. Uh, some of you have question, well, phosphorus is an anion and so is clay. Clay is an anion. Well, we'll have some cross bridging with the, the phosphorus to the organic matter because we can have positive exchange sites and negative exchange sites on the organic matter itself. And, and we'll look at the amount and type of clay. We'll also look at organic matter at that same time because we can have cross bridging to the organic matter and with the clays, if we have calcium affixed to that exchange site on the clay, we can bridge to that phosphorus. <coughs> Excuse me. We'll look at application timing and method. Uh, over the last few years with the, the nutrient loss reduction strategy coming about, and, and I probably uh, will upset a few co-ops by making this statement uh, simply due to their logistics. They, they want, would like to get a lot of the fertilizers applied in the fall so they can concentrate on spraying in the spring. And I'm pushing my customers that we push the, these phosphorus and potash applications closer to the time of planting than, than doing it in the fall and leaving it out there all winter for the potential to be lost to the environment. Aeration and compaction also affects phosphorus availability, which kind of ties in with nutrients and root movement through that soil. If we have poor aeration and highly compacted soil, those plant roots aren't going to move through that soil as well, and that will also affect the phosphorus uptake by that particular plant. We'll also look at the level of the soil phosphorus from that soil test and other nutrient interactions. Uh, phosphorus is, is, has very, very complex chemistry and, and while it may, may seem simple to write fertilizer recommendations for phosphorus, understanding the, uh, all the details that make that phosphorus available to a crop in any given season is very, very complex. And, and we could do an entire webinar on just that subject and it would probably be boring for the for the most part for for everybody including myself uh, soil moisture and temperature will affect the, the phosphorus availability uh, especially soil moisture and and, and we know that uh, we're looking at a lot of crops in certain areas of the state in the Midwest that are deficient in moisture and we're seeing a little bit of phosphorus deficiency in some corn uh, seeing a lot of potassium deficiency here in, in corn and uh, and soybeans this time of year were dry. It's not a function of actually having low soil test values. It's a function of having low soil moisture right now. And, and then again, I, I mentioned that, that soil pH 6, 8 to 7, 1. There's a little chart I have included on this slide that shows the maximum or highest phosphorus availability. And it's the, the different phosphorus species uh, that are used by the plant or in that 6, 8 to 7, 1 range. So that's where our highest P availability is. When we get uh, above pH 7.1, we get closer to pH of 8. Phosphorus is complex with calcium. And when we get on that low pH scale, pH 3 to pH 5, phosphorus can be complex with, with iron. And, and those, those two forms are fixed and not available to the plant. Okay, function of potassium. There's a whole host of, of, of important functions of, of potassium and, and, and some of the micronutrients as well. Uh, I'm not going to get into micronutrients as heavily today. Most of our, our, our micronutrients like zinc, manganese, and, and iron, those are used in the enzyme activation. But when I look at potassium, I've highlighted the three main ones that I consider when, when I, I look at, at having adequate potassium in the soil for our soybeans is that stomatal activity and water use. We all know that corn, when it gets under water stress, the, the leaves roll. Soybean does not do that, but the, the soybean plant has a, a high number of stomates on the upper and, leaf sur and lower leaf surfaces, and that potassium ion is what regulates the, the two guard cells around that opening to allow uh, oxygen out of the plant, CO2 in, and, and also that water use. So those stomates will, we need high potassium in those soils so those stomates function like they should. 
you know, close up when that plant's water stressed so we don't lose more water from that, that leaf. Uh, we also look at potassium in the, the water and nutrient transport mechanism. And, and then we definitely look at it for crop quality, lodging, and disease resistance. One of the, the big functions of potassium in, in the plant is it creates a, a thicker stalk, whether it be corn or soybean, uh, which alludes to helping us uh, reduce lodging. And, and the big one in, in, in all of that is potassium will help build a thicker wax layer on the leaf surface, which will help us in our disease resistance packages. Yes, we have good genetics in there that resist disease, but that little bit thicker wax layer uh, may take that pathogen longer to penetrate through the wax to get into the leaf. And if that particular spore, whether it be a, a a bacteria or a fungal spore, if that thing dies before it penetrates through the wax and gets into that leaf, we've helped with disease resistance. Okay, here's just a, a couple of quick photos. Th this uh, uh, showing potassium deficiency here in southern Illinois. This was a, a, a rather unique case, but, but that is classic potassium deficiency on the plant. I, I apologize that I don't have a photo of phosphorus deficiency in soybean, but there's just not a good photo to be had out there. The, these I took personally, and, and the bottom right photo that you're looking at, that is actually a function of manure applications from that dairy farm in the background. They started back there at the buildings, and they, they came toward you, so to speak, and when the manure spreader ran out, they went back to the barn and reloaded, and a, a good portion of this field never saw manure, and we had a potassium deficiency out there in those fields. So in this particular case, we, we went in and applied 200 pounds per acre of potash uh, across these soybeans. We had a, a, a nice rain about a week later, and this deficiency went away. It, w it was a, a case where we got, got really lucky out there, and, but it also got this guy to, to do more soil testing and, and look at the, the variability of his soil test within that field. Okay. I've got a little bit more on potassium than I do phosphorus because my my opinion potassium is more important for our, our soybeans and, and double crop soybeans than phosphorus in southern Illinois. Most of our, our soils in southern Illinois test good to high in phosphorus, but we're on the low side with, with respects to, to potassium. So what happens when we, we put that fertilizer out there? Well, a portion of it's going to be held in the exchangeable form, that, that part that goes to the uh, soil CEC, and as in a uh, rough rule of thumb, we'll have anywhere from 100 to 300 pounds per acre of readily available potassium on, on that soil CEC. Some of it will remain in that soil solution, three to five pounds per acre. That's the big portion that is taken up uh, by the crop. It comes from that soil solution. It can be taken up through exchange or with water, and then the exchangeable form above resupplies that soil solution K. So we're pulling it off the, the CEC, getting it into the soil water so it can be taken up by the crop. And, and then we'll have a portion of that can be fixed by the clays. And that, that portion fixed by the clays is slowly available to the crop. It's going to depend heavily on the amount and type of clay you have. We, we have uh, illite, montmorillonite, kaolinite as our, our clay types or our main, three main clay types. There's a couple of others besides that. But here in the Midwest, Montmorillonite clay is, is our expanding clay type, and it can fix that potassium. The, the inner lattice space is, is what they call it, and, and we can fix potassium, and we can also uh, fix ammonium in some of these clays. And we may be looking at something like 200 to 1,500 pounds per acre of, of fixed potassium in these particular clay types, and all of that is very slowly available. And then when we get to our sandy and, and acidic soils, we can, we can have potassium leaching. Okay, for Illinois, uh, if we have anybody out, outside of Illinois, I apologize that I don't have an exact example for you. But when we build soil tests for P and K in Illinois, we are, are looking at a buildup and maintenance fertilization scheme. And, and on average, it's going to take about nine pounds of P2O5 to change that soil test phosphorus value one point. To go from, say, a value of 30 to 31 on the soil test, we're going to need about 20 pounds per acre of DAP. For, for potassium, 
to change that value from 200 to 201 on the soil test, we're going to need about seven pounds per acre of potash. Uh, so here, here's still, and this is right out of the Illinois Agronomy Handbook, where we look at our peace supplying regions, the low, medium, and high supplying power of those soils. The, the recommended soil test level of uh, 50 down to 40, respectively, and, and that value at which no additional fertilizer will produce a crop response. I, I'm over here, if you can see my computer mouse move, I'm in the center of Washington County. I would be in the medium piece supplying power soil, and if I have soils that, that are a value of 65 or greater, I probably will not see a response to additional phosphorus fertilization. Let's switch over to potassium. We have two CEC regions. We, we have the, the low CEC region, which is southern Illinois, down below Effingham, where, uh, below that last glacial event. And then we have the, the high CEC region, the, the, the plains of central Illinois and northern Illinois that, that were ground and crushed real fine from that last glacial event. We have that recommended level of 260 for us down here and, and uh, a 300 pound K test for central northern Illinois and, and then again that no fertilizer uh, at values greater than 360 and 400 respectively that we may not see a crop response by applying additional fertilizer if your soil test levels are at 360 or 400 respectively or higher. <clears throat> okay here's some new data for you this this just came out here in the last week to, to 10 days officially uh, Dr. Emerson Nafziger has been working on collecting grain samples throughout the state of Illinois and, and revamping that uh, crop maintenance table that, that all of us are familiar with in the agronomy handbook. And, and uh, that was done on the Illinois NREC project. Got to make the plug there for NREC. Uh, but our old values, and I'll see if I can get my mouse to work, is 0.43 to 0.28 on down. Those are our old book values that are currently in the agronomy handbook. And, and after Emerson and, and his grad students and crew did all of this uh, grain, tissue, grain and tissue testing, they have found that we can lower these numbers. Our, our crops and our genetics today are much, much more efficient at, at removing P and K or even at lower soil test levels producing a good yield. And, and these new numbers is 0 0.37, 0 0.24, especially when we look at soybean 0.75 and 1.17 that is just in the grain content that is doing that maintenance fertilization we're dropping those numbers and, and that's also putting us a lot closer in line with Iowa State that you see on the, the right hand side and surrounding states uh, I have circled for the wheat that 0.6 most of you are used to seeing a value of 0.9 in, in the uh, agronomy handbook as far as the phosphorus needed by wheat and, and what that value was, for, for whatever reason, they decided to take the, the grain times 1.5 and, and put a, a 0.9 value. So we were for wheat, we were fertilizing phosphorus for the grain and the, the, the plant tissue, the crop. And, and uh, for this table, they divided that back out to give a value of 0.6 and, and, and then a new value of 0.47 on the wheat. And, and if you want to do it the old fashioned way, you can take that 0.47 times 1.5 and that would put you that comparable number of about 0.7 uh, to the old agronomy handbook. So we're, we're dropping everything for all of our, our different ones. Uh, we've seen a, a big drop in potassium for soybean, not so much on, on, on corn or for wheat. Okay, so when I look at maintenance P and K for soybean, uh, I've got another slide I'll, I'll mention here in a little bit, and, and I'll, I'll talk further on that. But I've got two sets of numbers on this slide. The, the blue numbers are our old values out of the agronomy handbook. The red numbers is what our change would be in new. This is the maintenance fertilization only. That, that portion of, of DAP and potash required to make that crop yield. And, and you can see that we, we've got some pretty good reductions in there. When we hit this 50 bushel soybean, level just the crop itself we we've dropped the dap by 10 pounds per acre and, and uh, uh 10 pounds per acre on the potash i i'm hopefully optimistic that that uh, farmers co-ops and other consultants will, will consider these new numbers sooner than later and, and this can help us with our nutrient loss reduction strategy here in illinois as well 
Okay, so, and I, I'll still mention this an, annual fertilizer or fertilization option. Uh, when with soil tests not increasing with, with trying to build that soil, especially with potassium, we may look at an annual option. Sandy soils is one that we may uh, look at an annual fertilization option, and uh, especially on some of this short tenure agreements or, or rent in the ground, we might look at that if crop budgets are tight. Uh, I don't necessarily prescribe to it. I would like you to put the, the required fertilization out there, but if the financial situation drives it on rented ground versus own ground, we might look at at doing 1.25 times the, the maintenance phosphorus and one and a half times the maintenance potassium needed for, for that particular crop to, to squeeze by. But by no means should you use the, those lower values every year. I, I probably shouldn't have put this slide in here, but it does mention it in the agronomy handbook and, and I know people will tend to use that from time to time. Now, the, the importance of, of soybean fertilization is, is in this statement. I've got, uh, I've got some guys that I still work with here in Southern Illinois that they do not believe in applying uh, fertilizer to soybeans. They fertilize ahead of their corn and, ahead of, uh, and, and let their beans uh, scavenge for nutrients that next year. And, and uh, then when they, they question me as to why their soybean yields have stalemated, and, and I can only get 40 bushel beans and my neighbor had 65. Well. I, I think some of it goes back to that fertility. And, and when you're just put fertilizing ahead of the corn and putting nothing out there for the beans, I, I, I think you're hurting yourself. You know, now on the other side of that coin, if uh, budgets are tight, in which there's a few farms that budgets may be tight here over the last couple, two, three years, you may not have a choice, but, but to try to fertilize that corn and, and, and get that higher yield and hope for a good price to go along with it. Okay, so phosphorus, potassium, uh, in general for soybeans and, and for all of our crops will help produce a larger root system. So we really don't want to skimp on fertilizer. I, uh, unfortunately, when, when farmers look at budgets, we've got a, a pretty much a fixed budget or a fixed price on, on all of our seeds, whether it be corn, soybean, or wheat. Uh, our herbicide programs uh, are getting quite extensive in, in some areas battling these weeds and th th those prices are fixed. So, so when we look at making a cut into a farming system, the first thing that seems to get cut is, is fertilization. That, that is something that we can, we can cut back on, and I don't know if that's necessarily a, a good choice at times. I mean, it does help build that larger root system. And, and with having adequate nutrients out there based on our, our soil testing or even previous yields, we'll get more above ground residue. And, and, and that residue gives us ground cover as well in those months where, where we don't have an actively growing crop out there for soil protection. Uh, adequate nutrients will give us a, a quicker ground cover and row closure, especially in soybeans. I mean, to battle the weeds in soybeans, uh, one of the key components right now is getting that row to close and, and uh, having adequate nutrients out there and providing for a, a healthier plant will also help with that row closure. Uh, we'll have improved water use efficiency in our crop with adequate nutrients out there, especially from the standpoint of potassium, which I alluded to earlier. And, and the, those P and K values in the soil out there will also help our crop resistance to stresses and disease. And th those two stresses I've alluded to earlier, as far as moisture stress and then, then disease pressures. So I'm going to go through an example scenario of uh, I, I say example, but, but I actually pulled the, this data out of a, a couple of my customers' databases and, and, and used their values and, and their, their fertilization scheme. Uh, we're looking at, at assuming the, the U of I build up and maintenance fertilization scheme for this particular setup. But if that producer applied 200 pounds of DAP and 150 pounds of potash, and he had the following soil test values, 35 uh, pound per acre P test that put him in the medium supplying power region and a 230 pound K test uh, low CEC region I asked the question did, did, did they or did he supply enough nutrients for, for his particular crops and, and by crops I mean corn and the following soybeans okay so 
when we look at that soil buildup requirement, I've already dropped in the the uh, new numbers here when we get to the crop maintenance. But for our soil buildup, we're going to need about 50 pounds per acre uh, uh, of DAP per year for four years to build that soil. And, and based on that 230-pound uh, K test, uh, subtracting that out from 260, we're also going to need about 50 pounds of potash per acre per year for four years. The, these tables were designed that, uh, to factor in the full amount of buildup and then spread it out over four years and, and put us into a four-year soil sampling cycle. And, and applying 50 pounds of DAP or potash to the meet that soil requirement is, is a, a lot easier to stomach than, than doing all of the buildup at once and looking at just 200 pounds of DAP or potash for that four-year cycle on year one. Okay, so for the pea fertilization, uh, if we were fertilizing for 175 bushel corn and 50 bushel soybeans, uh, running those new numbers that, that the U of I has published out there now, we would be, be looking at a total of needing about 225 pounds per acre of DAP for two crops. We're, we're fertilizing both crops at once. And bear in mind, the, these values are not taking in to consideration the, the soil test levels that, that this gentleman had in his field. Okay, for the K fertilization, again, the 175 and, and, and 50 for the, the yields that, that we're, we're fertilizing for. For that two-year cycle, we would be looking at needing about 170 pounds of potash per acre to, to sustain the crop needs for corn and soybean. Again, not taking soil test into consideration. Okay, so I'm going to jump back to, to where we were in the beginning. This, this guy put down 200 and 150. For two crops, he lets his beans scavenge. And, and when we do the addition, when we do the soil buildup, uh, I would look at the buildup for, for two years because he was basically fertilizing for two years. So I'd need 100 pounds of DAP for the soil buildup, a little over 140 pounds uh, of DAP or phosphorus fertilizer for the corn and a little over 80 pounds for the soybean. That put me at a, a total value of 300 and right at 325 pounds. Okay, we could, if we, we only wanted to put one year of buildup on, we could conservatively cut 50 pounds off that. We would still be right around 275. So he was a little bit short uh, on, on his crop needs if he got those two particular crop yields of 175 bushel corn, 50 bushel beans. Uh, same way with the potash, 100 pounds of, uh, of potash uh, buildup, 70 pounds for the, the corn and 98 for the beans. We were at 268. Um, like I said, we, we could, if need be, take 50 pounds off of there. We'd still be at 218 needed. He applied to 150. So we, we've cut this soybean crop pretty short, in my opinion. And when you, uh, let me go back to that one. I, I, I can't stress enough the need to fertilize soybeans, whether they be uh, full season beans or our double crop soybeans. Uh, with the coming to the double crop fertilization, I will put all of that fertilizer out front ahead of the wheat, take uh, advantage of the nitrogen in that DAP for that, that subsequent wheat crop, and, and then make sure we have adequate potash out there for those double crop soybeans, uh, especially in southern Illinois. Double crop soybeans have, have to struggle many years uh, at planting time. The, the soils are pretty dry, and, and that additional potash will, will help those soybeans in that growing season. Okay, on this slide, I, I, I mentioned a little bit on, on making cuts, but when we cut back on fertilizer, it will not uh, do a lot of things. It's not going to cut your taxes, interest rates, seed or pesticide costs. It's not going to uh, uh, cut machinery or fuel costs. Just by cutting back on fertilizer, it's not going to, to help on any of those. But, but what happens if you do cut back on fertilizers? You're going to reduce yield per unit area, especially if these soils were low testing to begin with, uh, you will start mining the nutrients uh, from the soil. So if you had a, say, a 200 pound potassium test and, and you cut back on potassium fertilizer in that next soil sampling cycle, you're gonna see those soil test values decrease. Uh, it's gonna re reduce our crop resistance to drought, disease, uh, maybe insect pressures and other stresses. A healthy crop 
due to good fertilization can help fight off a lot of these things on its own. Cutting back on the, those fertilizers will, will reduce our crop cover and residue uh, that can result in a, a greater erosion risk potential and, and eventually will reduce in profits. I, I know in a lot of our uh, international countries, if, if they don't supply enough nutrients and they take off more yield and, and, and harvest some of those residues, their profits reduce, their soils degrade, and it, it, it's a downward spiral on a lot of those soils. Okay, so do soybeans need fertilization? Uh, I feel they do. Uh, separate from corn and fer uh, corn fertilization, and, and don't forget about those double crops. And I think I, I actually went a little faster than I had anticipated, but but that was uh, is kind of the basis and my thoughts on. Soybean fertilization, I know we had some questions. Uh, hopefully Mark or Chloe is available where we can we can get to your questions here. But, um, okay, I hear somebody. Yeah, Terry, thanks. Thanks again, that's, that's all great information. We do have a couple of questions that came in uh, both prior to the webinar as well as during the webinar. So let's run okay. through those here while we've got a few minutes left. Okay. Uh, the first question, is how can uh, how can a producer see changes in profit from the soil test being taken? Okay, from from that standpoint, I don't look at a, a really a change in profit with soil testing. I look at more of a savings. Uh, uh, many of our fields here in Southern Illinois are, are will run a little bit higher on on the phosphorus soil testing side, and, and we can reduce those fertilization rates with with some of these higher P tests and have considerable savings. Do I see a profit? Not necessarily, but I do see a bigger savings. The, the only place I could really pinpoint a profit is if you have acidic soils and we apply limestone and we get that pH corrected, then, then you'll, you'll see a greater response taking those, those acid soils up to a region that is, is more suitable for the crop. Excellent, and that ties really nicely into the next question here. Uh, since you mentioned limestone. So the question is, <clears throat> what is the average cost per acre to apply lime? And then besides the cost of the limestone itself, what are the costs involved? Okay, for for applying limestone, uh, soil sampling is a good tool and, and using the variable rate technology, uh, we can reduce some of these costs on applying limestone. My particular region, back in the spring, uh, we were at $16 per ton for the limestone needed and we were at about $12 an acre variable rate spread. Now that sounds like a lot of money, but, but if we had 20 out of 60 acres that needed spread, that $12 per acre was per acre spread. They didn't charge for the other 40 acres that received no lime. So, so variable rate limestone will pay for itself day in and day out. And you'll have to be sure you check because, because Depends on the co-op you're working with, or the lime spreader, or your location within the state, or the, or, or even the Midwest. Uh, lime lime costs will will be variable depending on region. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, we've got a question here regarding moving away from grid sampling. Uh, really, the question: Why or why not? And if you're zone sampling, what factors do you do? What factors do you base those zones on? And I think you may have covered this, but let's address well, it again. A, a, a little bit, um, uh, I, I've covered that. I mean, some of it's personal preference on, on and, and history. I mean, if uh, somebody has been zone sampling a field for, for 40 years, stay on, stay on that scheme of things because that's how your history on that field has been monitored. I, I use the grid, grid sampling because of the highly variable soils. Uh, zone sampling, like I said, uh, it, gives us less samples needed uh, per field. And, and I, I feel the zone sampling in some areas, it, it's more suited for say central Illinois where we have a, a large, you know, that, that field could be a 300 acre field and it's one soil type. So it, it's more uniform. Uh, got a, a friend of mine does zone sampling and, and he's in South Eastern Illinois and he gets into the, those particular soil types down there and, and they're rather uniform and he does zone sampling. The, the other thing we could do with zone sampling is, is look at our yield maps, and, and we, we have high, medium, and low yields on a yield map if you categorize it into three values. So, so we could sample according to that yield map as well. 
Sure. Um, great. Uh, the next question, I know you uh, had mentioned as part of your presentation, manganese on soybeans. We've got a question here. Is there any special testing on high manganese soils specifically regarding GMO beans? Not, not particularly. You just want to uh, monitor your manganese levels. I know we, uh, and somebody may be alluding to the fact that GMO soybeans that, that we have poten potential Roundup flash in, in, in years gone by with manganese. And I know the U of I did a study on that where, where we applied up to, uh, I think it was four gallon per acre of, of Roundup on the soybeans with and without added manganese to, to take away that flash. Uh, some situations it took away the Roundup flash, others it didn't, but we saw no, no, uh, decreased yield due to that flash and and as far as any special testing not sure on that one that that may be something more out in uh uh an acidic region where we're looking at something like georgia or the east coast i'm just not quite familiar with that one mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've got another question here on management zones um and does creating management zones using precision ag tools, does that matter for generating high yield, high quality soybeans? I, I would like to think so because we're, we're going to generate a fertilization scheme based on a, hopefully a yield map and, and, and soil test values. And when we, we incorporate the variable rate fertilizer application in there, we'll be able to target those areas of stable yield versus the low and the high yields, which the targeting the low and the high yields can be kind of tricky at times because those two tend to flip flop depending on weather conditions and moisture each year. But, but uh, by all means, I think the, the manage, developing these management zones and, and getting that fertilizer out there in those areas where we have higher yields, we need to be replacing that to, to continue to have those high yields. Excellent, excellent. Uh, we've got another question here regarding the, the grids. Um, how many people, the question is, how many people would you estimate amend soil grids differently? That is, if one isn't planning to apply different rates, but rather amend the whole field, what type of soil sample collection strategy would you recommend, and how would you recommend amending the entire field? Well, that, that, one, that one is tricky. Um, you know, when I started doing this kind of work 20 some years ago, I would use the field average uh, pH, P or, or K value, and we would uh, amend that field accordingly. And uh, with the advent of the, the variable rate application, we, we can do that on the go. Now, I know uh, there, there's guys that try to amend each, say, two and a half acre grid separately. Uh, there, there's been Guys tried flagging the field and put on 150 pounds of, of DAP in one grid and, and, and 250 in another, but but I don't know if there's a, a benefit to that from from the standpoint that that we have lost time in, in driving around trying to fertilize each little square separately. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe I did or did not answer that question properly for you. I'm I'm not sure. I I think you got to the point of it, Terry. Um, We've got a couple more questions here, uh, specifically related to soybeans, and and really a question mm -hmm. here: Do you recommend foliar feeding K after soybeans once they reach the vegetative stages? Uh, I've seen good and bad out of that. It all depends on, or I won't say bad. I, I've seen a a response and I've seen a non-response to foliar K. Uh, where I've seen the responses to foliar K has been more so on drier years. Uh, there, there's been a, a, a good response, but you, you have to take into consideration for t potassium to get into the plant, it's got to come in the root system. So we could have a, a, a dry soil and a, a withering crop, so to speak, put foliar potassium on it, but it's not going to do us much good until we get a rain shower to, to wash that potassium into the soil. The, the benefit of that is as, as, as rainfall hits that plant, it's going to wash the potassium off the plant, some of that may run right down that stem and enter that little crack uh, oh, right next to the, the, the soybean plant and, and uh, get right in that root system right away. So, uh, you know, it can be at times personal preference. Right, right. Um, so another interesting question here uh, regarding 
the maturity groups of soybeans. Do longer season soybeans require more fertilizer than shorter season soybeans? That is a good question. I, I'm not. I'm not sure, but I would. I would tend to think, no, because I've I've seen I've seen some 2.5 maturity groups down in, in in deep southeastern Illinois under irrigation, yield 60 to 65 bushel per acre, and, and we've got uh, upland beans that are not irrigated make the the same yield. It, it really doesn't matter uh, what your uh, maturity group is that in order to produce yield it's going to need so much P and K and even nitrogen from that root system to produce that yield. Okay, I, I think that's that's a good thing for anyone throughout the state to note. Um, we, we've got an, another last question here, Terry. Uh, mm -hmm. Looks like a pro product question. I'm not familiar with this, but what's your opinion of using Veris? V-E-R-I-S? Mm-hmm. Varus is a Varus tool. If I, if if they spelled it right, and I know what they're talking about, it would be the Varus tool is a soil conductivity tool that that you can use to measure changes in soil type. And I actually I have have one of those tools myself, and I use it to map our sodium type soils down here in southern Illinois. And you could also use it to to develop a a, a yield map, so to speak, because all it's doing is mapping our changes in soil type. And that's all a yield map is, is changes in soil type and crop response to that soil type. Excellent. You uh, still with So I'm, well, I'm sorry, Terry, go ahead. I, I, I got quiet there for a second. I was checking to see if you're still with me. <laughs> we're here. Uh, Terry, we were just checking to see if any more questions were coming in, and that looks like that's the last of our questions. Uh, so with that, well, uh, I had, we'll I had one and... here. I've got one here that I didn't check off my list. Uh, we okay. did have one question. That you were reading some of them to me earlier about how often to soil sample for high-yield soybean. Uh, yes. And, and uh, I prescribe to a four-year soil sampling cycle. That's what the Illinois Agronomy Handbook uses. Uh, it would be personal preference if you wanted a soil sample on a shorter cycle. I, I still try to, to keep things to a, a four-year or four-crop cycle with wheat double crop soybean, soybean being a single crop season. The, the only situation where I shorten up my soil sampling, I put it on a three-year sampling schedule, and that is for my, my CAFOs, the, the concentrated animal feeding operations that are required by law to soil sample every three years for at least phosphorus. Excellent, excellent. I think that addresses one other question I just see here that I think you addressed, but can you fertilize ahead of corn for both corn and soybeans? Yes, I've, I've got, got guys that, that, that are doing that right, right now, even using variable rate. We've got some guys that have a variable rate pull type spreader and you, you've got a at a pretty good expense that first year, but we'll fertilize phosphorus for two years ahead of corn, and then we'll come in that same fall or next spring, and then we will fertilize potassium for two years ahead of the soybean crop. I like to have more potassium ahead of beans and, and more phosphorus ahead of corn. That way we can take advantage of that nitrogen and that phosphorus as well. So, Or you could do your, your blend of P and K and do two crops as long as you're meeting both the, both crops' needs. And that's what I'd alluded to when I went through that example scenario. Excellent, that's that's great information. And Terry, again, for everyone listening, uh, prior to the call, if you're not familiar with the illsoyadvisor.com web, web platform itself, there's a ton of great information up there, including a series of articles that Terry did last year four articles specifically on soil fertility and sampling. Terry, do you want to say anything else about those? Well, those four particular articles, we had had one that was soil testing, if I remember correctly. Then we had uh, one or two, I think it was broke out into nutrient management. And then the last one, if I remember correctly, was addressing the four R's because uh, the right source, rate, time, and placement of fertilizers. And, and, and I think that that, that 4R needs to apply to, to more than just fertilizer as well, or, or herbicides in, in, in particular too for 
good control of our weeds. But uh, yeah, that was a, a four part. We initially wrote that up as one, and it was so big that we had to break it up. <laughs> and, and yeah, uh, but so, there, there's there's a lot, and people need to really go to, to that website. Not not necessarily for my articles. There is a whole host of good information on there, and I, I go to the website quite a bit myself just to see what what other people are, are, are saying around the state. And, and again, for those of you not familiar, ilsoyadvisor.com, uh, we have been using that site for about three or four years now. And one of the great things is that we have enlisted CCAs throughout the state as soy envoys. Terry was a former soy envoy. So there's great information at your local level. There's good search functionality there as well. So if you're looking for information on a specific topic, whether it's weeds, pests, uh, soil sampling, just go ahead and hit the search and you'll find a wealth of information there. All of these webinars are also archived on that ilsoyadvisor.com website. So again, if, you're, if you need CEUs, those are always available. You can self-report. Uh, we're getting very close to the 11 o'clock hour. I don't see any other questions coming in. So again, thank you everyone for your time and joining us today and especially a, a great big thanks to Terry and all the great information presented today. Uh, Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Mark, and, and everybody, thank you for joining us today. If you didn't get your question answered, by all means, your uh, phone calls and emails are free. I don't charge for those. So uh, you have my information there. If you did not get your, your question answered uh, and, and need need an answer, give me a call, by, by all means. I don't mind. Thank you, Mark. Excellent, excellent. Thanks again, Terry. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.